<laughs> yes, of course dinner will be ready at five. Love you, sweet cheeks. Oh, sorry, that was your husband. Hi, Ugly. It's me, Buslia Fox, and welcome back to Hot or Hot. And today we'll be reviewing episode nine of RuPaul's Drag Race All-Stars season nine. Our queens were challenged to sing their hearts out in a loose parody of the classic horror film, Rosemary's Baby. And the runway category was Bring Back My Pearls. So we'll be going queen by queen to break all that down, plus covering the badge twist in which RuPaul says there is indeed a chance for every single queen still present in the competition to make it to the finale. And taking a look at the update on the latest drama involving Trinity the Tuck and Pheromone. I love tea. So let's start with that. So in last week's video, we covered the explosive drama between Trinity the Tuck and Pheromone, Jay Jolie, and even Shea Coulee, which all started with Trinity asking Monet on the Sibling Watchery podcast, which Rue girls do you hate? And on the most recent Sibling Watchery, Trinity joins Bob the Drag Queen to explain herself in the fallout of this bombshell of drama where Pheromone made allegations about what Trinity said in a specific situation involving her date. I've linked last week's video below if you need to catch up on that. But clearly having experienced the scorn of the fan base over this past week, Trinity has completely changed her attitude about this situation and tries to approach things less in a stirring the pot way and more in a let's clear the air and move past this way. Like I have to clear this up because she made some statements that were very not true. So I might as well close this chapter out on this podcast. She starts off by confirming to Bob that the meeting between her and Farah and Farah's date did indeed occur all those several years ago. But Trinity denies making the transphobic comments that Farah alleged she made. One of the, the remarks that she said that I said was, I can't believe there are men walking around with like, girl, okay, I'm from Alabama, but even I back then knew there was a such thing as a trans man and knew what the biology of a trans person is. She goes on to say that I said some other even more harsh things. Trinity also informs us there was a certain detail about the number of attendees at this dinner that was left out of Farrah's story. Apparently, Trinity had two friends at that dinner with her. But what she failed to say was that I had two of my friends were also at dinner with us. So it wasn't just the three of us. It was her her date, me, and two of my friends. And when recounting her version of the story, Trinity says that it wasn't her that made any comments at all about Farrah's date. It was actually Trinity's friend who made a variation of those comments, which were not exactly what Farrah said Trinity said. One of my friends said, well, actually, I'm the one that said something. But what she said was said was not what was said. How all of this started was her date was a star and we were all having a conversation about that lifestyle and what we were all into and Farah had mentioned that she has been with trans men and then my friend said I could never do that I've never been with a that's what they said. In addition, Trinity also maintains she did indeed invite Farah to stay at her Florida house several years ago, something that Farah had denied. She also made some statements saying that I never had a conversation with her offering her to come stay with me, which is also fake and false. I was constantly in contact with her. And basically Trinity says everything Farah said was either misremembered or incorrect, which ultimately leaves us with a he said, she said situation. And unless one of these third parties, either Farah's date or Trinity's friends, decides to come forward with their version of the story to corroborate any details, then we may never truly know what transpired at that dinner. Maybe though they can work it out in the remix. I have to tweet that literally right now, hold on. If you aren't aware, I'm referencing the Charlie Lord collaboration where they worked it out in the remix. A girl can hope, but I suppose hope is a dangerous thing for a girl like me to have. Okay, I'll stop. Um, let's get on to the episode of the week, shall we? So first up and in the order they hit the runway is Plastique Tiara, who in the musical Rosemary's Baby Shower plays the starring role of Rosemary. And for those of you unfamiliar with Rosemary's Baby, the movie which this musical is parodying, the basic premise is that this girl moves into a new apartment in New York with her husband and ultimately gets impregnated by the spawn of Satan through some rituals happening right next door. A tale as old as time. And Plastique's approach to this role is really interesting, giving the character this really nasally vocal fry baby voice, kind of like Paris Hilton or Britney Spears in her music, which was so interesting to me because in the movie, Rosemary is essentially being gaslit and tricked by everyone around her. Yet here, Plastique's role is completely flipping that on its head and she's finding a lot of power and like liberation in the idea and thought of having Satan literally inside of her. Plastique's dance style also really shone through well 
Bell in like the chair scene. And I was drawn to Plastique anytime she was on stage. She did her job well. And I guess at this point in the competition where Plastique has like what, four badges already? I shouldn't be surprised that she continues to slay every single challenge, but she's doing it and she's doing it well. This performance was hot. And over on the runway, welcome to the birth of Plastique. And y'all, I've got to say, soak it up. Because the bar of elegance, poise, fashion, and realness drag has been raised time and time again with Plastique's runways. And I don't know if we're ever going to have another queen on a season of Drag Race ever be able to match this level of beauty on the runway. That shell-inspired cape collar that unfolds and then drapes from her arms as she comes down the runway is such a beautiful and intricately well-done detail. Plus, I love her use of pearls to create the bodice and contrasting with that silk fabric at the bottom. And like her wig lace is always unclockable, but my God, it's just the icing on such a beautiful cake this week. This look is absolutely hot. And next up, the original drag queen, Chanel, who in the challenge is playing the role of Sydney, which is essentially a role that I think is being taken from the character of Minnie Castavet and split into two people here between Chanel as Sydney and Angie as Ruth. And Minnie in the movie is one of my favorite characters, I think in cinema of all time, because she is just so bad crazy and does all of these insane things with her physical acting. Like there is a clip you can watch on YouTube where she is eating cake with a fork, which she holds in about seven different positions, unhinged, completely unhinged. Please go enjoy Mini Castavet uh, in this movie. I beg you. Regarding Chanel's performance as Sydney, the realtor in this musical though, I thought she did such a great job bringing realtor energy to this. Like you can't tell me in another life, Chanel was not a high-end realtor selling houses in the Hamptons or something. Like she just has the energy of that. I also really enjoyed how she characterized her singing and it felt like she really put that Chanel stamp on this role. I will point out though her solo choreo was more about the blocking and big movements of the character rather than really tight dancing which was a great choice for them to make because it allowed her acting and singing to shine through over one of her weaker skill sets. See you at the closing. This performance was hot. And on the runway, I gagged so hard because when she turned that corner, I thought that was Gottmik for at least three seconds. Cause she's got that face painted white with some great makeup details and all of these pearl details in this tight cat suit thing, which is just insanely gorgeous to look at and so much fun. She's blending camp with Couture in this sci-fi futuristic style. That feels really fun in like a Barbarella or Fifth Element way. Like this is absolutely the mother of pearls. This look is hot. And next up, it's got me who in the challenge plays the role of Blair the Exorcist, because what would a RuPaul musical about a horror movie be without other random characters? I love that they did that. And in this parody, she comes in as a sort of comic relief for Rosemary to almost tell her, it's okay that you're gonna have Satan's baby in you. Like, look how I turned out. And I'll say, Gottmik is not the best dancer in this cast, and I think they knew that. So instead of trying to make her do a bunch of crazy choreography, they did a lot of we'll say like smoke and mirrors to make the physicality of her performance really fun. There was the spinning wig in the center of the stage and then the back flips, of course, which were facilitated by the backup dancers. And all that was executed perfectly. Plus I think she had a good characterization of this possessed dead girl on the stage. I do think she could have done a different voice choice besides the Paris Hilton vocal fry that she often leans into for comedic challenges. And you can usually see in the group choreo moments, she is in the back and sometimes out of sync or just not shown in them at all. So I give her performance in this like a warming up. But on the runway where she always shines, she brings some edge and goth to this pearl brief that is absolutely breathtaking. And as a queen who plays with black and white, I think it was so cool to see her choose black pearls to make her look out of, which was so unique. And super sickening how she also integrated other like horror elements into this, such as the ram horns and the skeleton bones dangling across the cat suit that she's wearing. And the show did make a point of including the clip where RuPaul asks Gottmik who made this look and she responds Diego Montoya, who I want to highlight because I love all of his designs. You can see his looks on queens like Nymphia in her crowning look and Sasha Velour in her coronation look. Anyways, Gottmik absolutely ate this up and this look is Totally. <laughs> Next up, baby, you can't read the doll but the pit stop is trying a little bit. So we have seen a little bit of drama from Roxy over on her ex profile, acknowledging some clips from the pit stop where they're discussing her performance and looks on All Stars. Roxy could sell anything to me. She's I think she me. could be sold anything at the <laughs> store. 
On her profile this past week, she wrote, thank you for the pit stop clips. Yet again, I don't care what she thinks. And she hasn't been at team me since day one on that show. It's evident. Everyone's entitled to have their opinion and that's hers. Y'all lived and that's what matters to me at Trixie Mattel, heard loud and clear babes. She said, I'm tagging the doll. I'm tagging that doll. <laughs> Baby, you can't read the doll. In the challenge, Rox plays the role of Pennywise the Clown, which was such a gag for me. I thought Roxy absolutely nailed this in a way that I really did not expect her to. She has just been so much more consistently versatile this season than she ever has on Drag Race before. And it is just obvious that the culmination of her talent and skills in the arena of drag are so perfected and the proof is in the pudding. What shocked me most about this Pennywise performance though was the look. The makeup was so on point and the characterization of the body movements I think was also so like you might expect a killer zombie clown to move. She also made a great character choice with that guttural throat noise, which she was so consistent with throughout her performance. And there's really nothing I would have changed about this. I thought it was totally <laughs> On the runway though, I wasn't totally spooked. I was kind of expecting a little bit more because the runways from this episode were so jaw dropping. Like every time a queen turned the corner, it was just like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And then Roxy turned and you're like, okay, she looks good but I think she could have gone bigger and bolder here. It's going for like a 20s flapper girl thing, showing off the thick and juicy Curvilicious body, which looks great. I think the silhouette is absolutely nailed, but there's something I think going on with that body stocking that kind of makes the skin look very flat. Like maybe some shading in the stocking underneath the pearls could have enhanced that detail a bit. And I also think using some different sizes and variation of pearl patterning could have added some more texture and elegance to this look because it was a little one dimensional with that same row of pearls over and over and over coming down her body. So does she look bad? No, but compared to the other girls tonight, this is gonna be a rock. And next up, is anyone feeling gapey today? <laughs> Why did she say that? Unhinged, Miss Georges. Okay, in the challenge, Georges plays Morgan Megan, the AI doll from the movie Megan, a great modern horror movie that had a lot of marketing and PR centralized around this doll's dancing, which was kind of parodying all of the TikTok dancing trends that were happening at the time. And Georges expressed a little bit of hesitation going into this role, not sure if she could tap into that robotic acting with the dancing. And I think because the show knew she was such a good dancer, they gave her some of the hardest choreography, which she absolutely absolutely took to town and rode back on a horse like she killed it. But even more impressive was how she used her face while she was lip syncing because she actually was showing that big eye robotic type of mouth thing that Megan did. And like sure, Jordis isn't really a singer and you could hear that, but I think she did a good job and I really was so impressed with this. It was absolutely <laughs> And on the runway, she is giving us Bride of Frankenstein goes to prom is, is kind of the vibe that I got. And overall, I like how different this is for Georges's fashion. Like I just wasn't expecting her to mix horror and glam in this way. And I love how elegant that gold dress looks with the pearl details on the chest and on the waist with that little corsage moment. I will say maybe there could have been some darker detailing on the look to match the wig a little bit better or maybe leaning into some spookier makeup or something just to give a little more cohesion top to bottom but i was happy with this overall i'm gonna give it a <laughs> and next up it's angie 2.0 who in the challenge plays the role of ruth who as i mentioned did seem like a split of that mini character with chanel and just like the movie ruth brings in this poisoned food which is helping to facilitate the growth of satan inside of her and she's what ultimately cues the baby shower party of rosemary with the horror characters from all the other movies and i think angie did a good job here but i don't know if she brought anything different to this role than she has brought to previous acting and comedy challenges. And the character really was written to be played how she played it, but I think it would have been more interesting for her to choose a different character and step outside of her box just a little bit to showcase some versatility. She did a good job though. I just didn't find the performance necessarily memorable, but I'm gonna give it a <laughs> But over on the runway, she said, you want versatility? I'm gonna give you some versatility. This is a beautiful book from Angie. She's giving me Vegas. She's giving me Showgirls. She's giving me Birth of Venus. All of that wrapped into one. And I love the big draggy feather overcoat that she comes onto the stage with, which she wears all the way to the end of the runway, as you should with a reveal, and then takes it off. She said, pause for the big reveal. And the reveal was very worth it. This has to be one of the most expensive looking garments she owns. It's stunning. And really week after week, I think it's just so fun to, to see how Angeria has upgraded her drag and really just brought a whole new level of excellence to all stars. This look is totally <laughs> And next up, hi those feet, it's Nina West, who in the challenge plays the role of Dr. Poltergeist, which is a role that they 
drew for. Because Several Queens wanted this role, although I'm not really sure why. It felt like a kind of a boring role to me. And for context, in the movie, the Doctor is essentially working with the Santana cult to help facilitate the growth of Satan inside of Rosemary, which is a pivotal twist that Rosemary learns about near the end of the movie when she figures out that there is literally no one around her that she can trust. And this role is interpreted in the musical as essentially like a gospel pastor role where she's singing like come into the light and taking everybody to church. And the thing is for what the role was, Nina did an excellent job. Like she obviously has that musical theater skill set, which lended her such a perfect performance in this, I'll say. It's just I found the role kind of boring compared to all the completely over the top horror characters that were in the rest of this musical. See at the clinic, Nina, this was hot. And over on the runway, she turns the corner and says she is giving us sci-fi Elizabethan celebration. And the first thing I noticed was the pearl glasses that she has on, which are covering most of her face, kind of maybe getting some inspiration from the artist Hungry who does face accessories and makeup like that. And this look is all about over the topness, too muchness, and disgusting amounts of elegance and glamour but in a very theatrical stage theater way, which is very in that realm of Nina West's style. And fashion wise, this isn't really to my personal tastes, but I think it's executed well for what it is. And I'm gonna give it a <laughs> And finally, she's just a little baby. It's Miss Fangie, who in the challenge plays the baby. The baby of Satan, that is. And what I realized about this role is that it is essentially a parody of Lil Nas X's Montero, which you can definitely hear with the backing beat and the way Vanjie is rapping the song. Plus, of course, you know, being dressed like the devil. And I think Vanjie did fine in this role. It seemed like she got the job done, but I'm not sure there was an extra spice or layer that she cooked into this performance, which kind of made the finale of this musical whelming. So I'd give her a safe hot here. But on the runway, we are witnessing the birth of Venus part two. Is that a Venus in your shell or are you just happy to see me? And y'all, this runway is a gag and a half. This is such a beautiful look from Vanjie. And although she didn't give us the finale, I think I was hoping for in the Rusical, she did give us a beautiful finale on the runway. That silver sequin shell collar thing is absolutely insane. And that pearlized bodice with the pearlized tights are such beautiful details. She looks like a little slippery wet pearl just slipping throwing out of her shell. I'm gonna give this look a <laughs> And as for top two this week, Personally, I thought Georges and Plastique stood out the most, but the judges picked Georges and Chanel as their top two. And honestly, I think the top two could have been spun in several different directions. There was a lot of really solid performances tonight and the Rue School overall was great. But honestly, thank God Chanel finally got a badge and not just one, but two, which we'll talk about here in a second. And it was worth it to give these two the win this week, if only to see them lip sync against each other because they both killed it. I did react to this lip sync over on my Patreon and you can watch my reaction to the lip sync and this episode exclusively on my Patreon. So click the link in the description of my video to do that. But I thought this lip sync was so fun because we got to see two very different drag performance styles juxtaposed next to each other in a way that worked really well for the song, actually. Chanel was giving us that big, bold, classic drag performance with lots of emoting and lip syncing for the back rows at the back of the stage in the back of the room at the back of the country. Like she has such a presentation to her lip sync, NASA's up there in space watching this happen. Obviously though, there was a lot of choreo or death dropping, but Georges did bring that to the stage in a really excellent way. And Rue ultimately decides to give them both the win this week, which is fine. It's also just like, who cares? You know, we're just happy, I guess, that both charities are going to get money. That's great. But this double win thing for no additional competitive elements added into the competition is just another symptom of All Stars 9's lack of tension. Cause it's kind of like, okay, cool. So so I guess we could just give the win to both queens who lip sync every single week and give a bunch of money to charity. Why not? But holy guacamole, let's talk final thoughts. So this musical overall, very solid. But as you could probably tell, I loved the movie they were parodying. What I think made it so great though, was how they utilized the different queens' talents in ways that helped their performances instead of hindering. Queens who were stronger at acting and singing could showcase that while not having to worry about crazy dance moves and vice versa. And another thing I was happy with, and I know I harp on this like every single time they do it, but the fact that they let the queens record their own vocals for this musical made it so much better. And it does every single time because it personalizes those performances performances in a very memorable way. And this was also the last week of the Ruby Red Snippers, thank God. Because these snippers have been, I think, the biggest flop of the season. Like it was the one show element that could have added 
just one small layer of tension or edge into this reality TV show competition, but ultimately did nothing but be a wet noodle. Snipping somebody meant absolutely nothing every single week of this competition that it was included, except to bring like a little comedic relief at the end of every episode. I think if they're gonna keep something like this for the future, they are getting to redo it maybe in an itemized way, much like with the season 16 potion. I think queens should win the ruby red snippers and then be able to save those in their pocket to use maybe next week or the week after to block a queen from getting a badge after RuPaul has announced that they've won one. Actually being able to influence another queen's winning of a badge would allow for so much behind the scenes alliance drama and actually make the end of the episodes mean something. And finally, the twist of this week's episode is the top two won two badges, one to keep and one to give away. But this was yet another twist that was ultimately underutilized because the top two, Chanel and Georges, just swap their giveaway badges. And like, yes, I'm happy Chanel now has two badges. That's great. But it would have made more sense competitively, although it wouldn't have been fair or whatever, for Chanel to give her extra badge to somebody with less badges, like Gottmik or Vanjie or Nina, so as to not put Georges so far ahead of everybody else now. So we've got Gottmik, Chanel, Vanjie, and Nina all with two badges, and Jerry with three, and Georges, Plastique, and Roxy all with four. And as for hottest <sighs> this week, I'm gonna give it to Plastique Tiara on the runway and Georges in the challenge. And I also asked my patrons to vote for their hottest hots, and this week they've chosen Vanjie on the runway and Georges in the Rusical. And finally, I want to give an extra special shout out to Ashley Brungart, Daddy D, Fa, Leisha, Laura, Matthew Burns, Mikhail Minst, Topher, and Will and Tana, who are all supporting me at the Bussy Queen Collector tier at patreon.com slash Queen. See you later. Love ya. Bye.